All right, folks, if you're tuning in now, chances are you clicked on that episode and it said firearm maintenance or something along those lines. I guess we haven't even picked out the title exactly yet. And for many of you, you might be thinking about, you know, that title and thinking firearm maintenance. What a bunch of baloney. And you're not wrong. You're very welcome here. This is a safe environment for folks like you. We have some guests across the table from Mark and I here. And in between us lie three fully kitted out AR-15 style rifles. And one of them is really dirty. One of them apparently is moderately dirty. And one of them apparently was just recently cleaned. And anyway, these guys across the table are going to have to introduce themselves because they've talked to Mark and I and a couple other folks around here about firearm maintenance in the past. And part of what they do here at Vortex is maintaining a lot of firearms uh, because of, yeah, just their job and the location and where they work. And so I'll stop being so cryptic and just let them introduce themselves. It's Pete and Adrian here. And let's go in alphabetical order. So we'll have Adrian go first introducing himself. And uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, kind of uh, fun facts, what you do here. And, uh, yeah. All righty. Uh, well, my job here is, uh, I guess the title is Range Operations Manager. I've been at Vortex for a little bit over a year. Um, so we've got a really cool range facility here uh, at Vortex. 100-yard uh, indoor range, 50-yard indoor range. Use it for all sorts of uh, product testing, demos, training, all, all sorts of things like that. So uh, I, I think I got the coolest job in the company. I get to play on the range all day and, and work with people when they're shooting. So, um, so I run that facility, teach a lot of people about shooting, maintain some firearms down there. Uh, prior to that, I was in law enforcement for 13 years. I uh, was a SWAT member for six, uh, several years as a SWAT sniper. And uh, as related to what we're talking about here today, I oversaw uh, patrol rifle maintenance for my uh, department that I spent my last 10 years of my career with. And we had about 400, 450 rifles that uh, needed to be kept up. When you say you oversaw the maintenance of your patrol rifles. Was that a job that was that was given to you? And when you got that, did you think, all right, yes. <laughs> or did you think, dang it. Uh, it was one of those jobs where I saw some big problems with how some things were being done. And uh, it, it just needed to be done. So I was kind of the guy to step up and say, hey, you know, there's some problems with what we're doing here. And they said, okay, well, that's great. Why don't you take care of it? <laughs> so, Yeah. So you didn't draw the short straw, you just took it. Yeah, you, yeah, I kind of... created the short straw. Yeah. <laughs> there was a big bear trap, and I, I walked right into it. So <laughs> well, there you just, have yeah, it. Off in the story of my life. All right, <laughs> well, you've been doing a lot of this for, for quite a while then. And Pete, why don't you introduce yourself to listeners? Yeah, my name's Pete Schreier. Uh, I've been working here at Vortex. It'll be a year in April. Um, I work down there with Adrian on the range. I am the range safety officer, head firearm instructor, um, I have five years of law enforcement experience with the Dane County Sheriff's Office. Uh, prior to that, I was in the Army for five years, and I carried something very similar to this for most of my time there. Uh, fun fact about me, I don't really like cleaning firearms. <laughs> I don't. You're among friends. Yeah. Yes. yes. I don't like cleaning firearms. The Army tried to teach me a couple things. They tried to teach me how to make my bed every morning and to clean a rifle, and I think I kind of rebelled after I got out. I don't do either, so I don't, <laughs> I don't make my bed, and I don't like cleaning rifles. All right, all right. Now, you said something really interesting. Actually, we were kidding around about the fact so many times in podcasts I come on and say, well, right before the podcast, we were saying this, and, and this time we were, we were close to uh, digging ourselves into that hole once again. But you, you did say a phrase that I wanted to bring up again, and you said that all too often people are far too concerned with cleaning their firearms rather than maintaining their firearms. Is that, is that what it was, or there's a difference between the two? What, what was it? Yes, they're not one and the same. So cleaning um, and maintaining are different. Right. So, uh, you know, I came from the Army. I came from the infantry. And there was this hyper-obsession with cleaning out every little piece of carbon from that AR, or M4, every little piece of carbon. And, you know, you could go to turn your rifle back in, armor would put his finger in there, found a little bit, nope, go back. And... The downside of that was it, we just became hyper-obsessed with getting in there, getting all the nooks and crannies, getting dental tools, using really extreme methods to get all that carbon out. You would have, you'd wipe the rifle completely down, no lubrication, nothing at all, 
uh, you'd scrape every little piece off, so so all the finish over the years gets wiped off, and then you turn in this bone dry M4 carbine that's been scraped to hell, okay? And you didn't want to put oil on it because the oil would make all the little carbon seep out again. So we'd leave it dry. Oh. So the end result was exactly opposite of what you were trying to avoid. So now you would have these rifles sitting in an arms room. Okay. They're completely dry, no carbon on them. And people would wonder why, hey, if nobody touched it in a couple months, look out, there's a little bit of rust on the barrel. Yeah. So it, it, it ended up being... You have a lot of exposed surfaces now. Right. There was this... This myth going around that carbon caused corrosion. Carbon does not cause corrosion, right? U.S. military stopped using corrosive ammo in the 1950s, okay? But as a byproduct of that, that, that culture still remained. Hey, we got to maintain these. We got to keep them clean or a little rust, or, and, and it'll fail you when you need it most, okay? And that culture still persisted. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not bad. It just got warped over the years. Now, is that, is that have, does that have a lot to do with, y- you look at, you look at the evolution of the AR-15-esque platform or the M16. When the M16 first came out, I remember my dad talking about it, you know, uh, and he was in Vietnam, and he would he would talk about just the, the reputation that that rifle gained as just being a jam-o-matic, you know. And, and a lot of people thought it was because of where they were, you know, the jungles and stuff like that. They were getting a lot of crap in their rifles, and it was slowing everything down. It was causing jams. He would talk about how everybody used to round their, what was it, I think it was 20 round mags back then. They yeah. would load 18 because they never wanted to ro- load a full mag. You know, if, if I'm saying any numbers wrong, feel free to call them out in the Instagram comments below later on. But, you know, it, did that kind of have something to do with what, what began this sort of hyper-focus on cleaning and I, stuff? I, I believe it did. Um, when that rifle was first issued, um, the military ignored the manufacturer's recommendation for ammo, and they used really cheap all ammo and it oh. fouled everything. Uh, the the rifles were issued without any sort of manual. Mo- at the time, most guys were going through basic training, learning how to shoot and maintain an M14. Okay, they get they get in Vietnam. Here's your M16. No manuals, no cleaning <laughs> kits. Okay, so uh, people just dis- oh, it must just be self cleaning. Okay, and and uh, that combined with some other things, um, I don't believe the chamber was chrome lined. You throw it in the uh, jungles of Southeast Asia, it was just a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Um, the, the rifles we have and the current military issue M4, they've gone through a lot of different changes, generations, but you even talk to like Colt armors, you know, the, the Colt military issue M4, they, they don't recommend detail cleaning the rifle at all. And it was kind of a big shock to me. I learned all this when I got out of the Army. My experience, personal experience um, in the Gulf, in Iraq, as long as you kept it lubed and you maintain the magazines, the rifle ran flawlessly. I never had a problem with mine. Okay. Um, and a lot of that depends on the environment. You know, granted, I, I get a reputation for having a really filthy rifle here, but it is maintained. Um, if I'm in Iraq and there's a lot of sand getting in there, yeah, I'm cleaning that out. Okay. Um, but I think it's been our experience that, that people spend too much time cleaning the gun, not enough time keeping it lubed. And yep. Not enough time making sure the parts are all functioning properly, making sure their magazines aren't working properly. Yeah, and and like you said, that's that culture came out of that that rifle, the early teething issues. But that stuff got fixed pretty quick. It did. Okay, it got fixed pretty quick. Yeah, and like you said too. I mean, just even even thinking back to the sand thing, you know, getting sand out of your rifle, I can imagine would be a good thing because actually, if you have sand in there, I can only imagine it's doing the same thing that a really harsh dental pick would do. Yes. Because when you're cycling a bunch of stuff, it's very, yeah, abrasive. Uh, sandpaper is, I'm called sandpaper for a reason. So you, a lot a lot of things in there. And, and for example, one of the ones that I want to get into later on is definitely the magazine maintenance because... <laughs> that was going to be my question. Is that a separate podcast or is that part of no, this No, I one? think that's on this podcast for sure, even though I'm sure Pete would probably say you can make your own podcast about it. But, but... That one, I remember, I, I always thought, you know, ah, well, it is right. you got to maintain it. It makes sense. And then all of a sudden, one day I heard you guys talking about magazine maintenance, and I thought, okay, come on. This is ridiculous. No, that's a, that's a big one, and that's a big one that we'd see in law enforcement a lot, is officers would be issued a gun when they start their career, 
and they would have the same three magazines, whether it's for their handgun or their AR or whatever. 20 years later, they're shooting the same handguns, which have had, or same uh, handgun magazines, same AR magazines, which have now had thousands and thousands and thousands of rifles, or, uh, rounds through them. They've dropped them on the floor. Um, over the years, you know, manufacturers make upgrades, product improvements to their mags, and mags are disposable. They have a, they have a limited life. You use, okay. them, use them until they wear out, and when they're done, you throw them away. They're so simple. How could anything ever go wrong with them? I mean, it's a piece of plastic with a, like, you know, looks like a coiled up violin string yeah. spring underneath it and just plastic outside body. What's... Not a lot to them, and this is uh, this is one of the the uh, P mags, and obviously there's aluminum mags, there's steel mags, there's all sorts yep. of other mags. For those watching on YouTube, like, again, you can check it out. We have some rifles here that we'll talk about in a magazine that Adrian's holding with a few simunition rounds in it. Yep, yeah, we got just some dummy rounds just here. Just in case so. we go crazy and we'll start giving each other wells. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, like you said, I mean, they're disposable. I mean, once you fire the ammunition out of them, they're, they're done, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not that disposable. I think yeah, there, there's a common misconception that it's an accessory. It's not. It's a component to the firearm. It yeah. needs to be maintained. Okay? It's, it's mm-hmm. not an accessory. It, if you don't have that, that rifle is not going to operate as it's designed. Probably okay? one of the leading causes of malfunctions, um, you know, with AR platforms certainly and other platforms is, you know, magazines that are in poor shape. Really? Yeah. I feel like yeah. I almost, in my mind, I'm making it akin to, like, your scope rings and your bases. Yeah. Like it's kind of like that forgotten component that's yeah. really yeah. so important. That everything I mean, hinges upon. It, it's kind of the delivery mechanism of the things that go bang. Or like tires on a car. Yep. Yes. Something yes. everybody else over always overlooks. It's a complete, it's like, complete system. Yeah, you know, it is. You're only as strong as your weakest link. Hmm. So, yeah, with the magazine specifically, you know, um, big thing that I, I tell people to do is just inspect them, right? So whether it's an aluminum mag or a, a plastic mag, you know they're they're kind of welded here on the on the backside. So you're looking to see if if you're you know splitting. Um, oh yeah, look, the portion that kind of that almost uh, keys up into the mag weld there at the rear. Mm-hmm. And the aluminum mags, I should have brought one, but they have uh, actual rivets. So you will watch those rivets, make sure they don't uh, pop. Feed lips can crack, so you look for microscopic, really small cracks in the back of the feed lips. Mm-hmm. And then uh, also, you know, feed lips can wear. Mm-hmm. So there's some things that you can you can check. Uh, um, you know, just give them a good uh, overall inspection. Uh, for the most part, uh, you know, you can pop the base plate off, um, blow them out, whatever, if they're really, really dirty or dusty. But for the most part, um, you don't want to lube them or anything like that. Just, okay. Yeah. Would you say that the primary thing that goes wrong with mags is the exterior body there where stuff like steam start splitting and feed lips start cracking? Yeah. and that's it's what not I, so They much, just wear out. Yeah. It's not so much like the spring that goes bad it's it's more along it's more no. just it's more the body the body i i so these re, it, these retail for about ten dollars yeah okay and we label them for a reason we got we got a, a number on there so i know if i'm at the range i have a malfunction okay and i trace it back to the magazine this thing's gone all okay. right i'll inspect it if i have another malfunction it's gone yeah. we're not even going to worry about it and and i see a lot with students and and former co-workers um if you ever see a USGSI aluminum magazine and it has a black follower, that thing went out of service in the early 90s. Those got replaced by green follower magazines in 1992. And the green followers think, even kind of suck, don't they? They're not horrible. Okay. They're not horrible. But if you find one with a black follower, you shouldn't be using it. And I constantly see people using magazines that are 20, 30 years old. Okay? It's, it's a part of the rifle. It's very inexpensive. If you have any issues with it, just get rid of it, get another one, move on. I yeah. don't really have a preference when it comes to magazines. I think all of them are really good. Um, I know the Magpul follower, if you just take a USGI um, magazine, put a Magpul follower on there, those I've found have been really reliable. Um, I think people just need to kind of keep up on it. Remember, it's a part of the rifle. Is, yeah. is most of the maintenance then just that visual check and then... And- is that really what you're giving? You're just giving it a visual inspection, not using necessarily like a magnifying glass or any equipment like that? Well, or? Th- that's a great deal of it. Um, you know, when, when we would do, so we would do uh, biannual inspections at our police department. So every two years, we would go through everybody's rifle. Um, we would ask them to make sure it's clean ahead of time. And that's, that's really, in my opinion, the major reason for cleaning, so I can look at my parts and ins- visually inspect them. Okay. So we go through that, and we had a, a, a checklist of probably 40 different things that we were looking for, 
and most of them would be a visual inspection, you know, inspecting critical components like your bolt, making sure that your, uh, you know, your bolt doesn't have cracks in it. Um, you know, looking at your gas tube, making sure the the nub on the end of the gas tube is wearing evenly. You know, just just things like that. You know? Okay, okay, but yeah, with the magazine, it's not so much that you replace. You're just you're just basically assessing when it's time to to let them go. You you said you label. So this one says V three. Yep. Are you almost? Is that almost like when somebody like a manufacturer does a um uh lot, like has a lot? You know, where oh hey, we saw something go wrong with a product off this lot. You know, so maybe we'll go. Like, yeah. If you do, you have other mags that are labeled V three, for example. That V four, V five. You V6, started them all at the yeah. same time. So like we're something? we're in a class, you know. I and and these are these are ones we give out to students. So I know if, if that student you know has a malfunction, I'm like, hey, I'll look at this magazine, and if anything else crops up with it, it's gone. Oh, I see. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, we just we take it out of the system. Uh, I know Magpul. If if like you get cracks in these, I know if you send them back, they'll replace them for you. Oh, for that's free. Cool. Yeah. So. Pretty cool. Real awesome company. Nice. And I'll just throw this out there specifically for people in, you know, military or law enforcement. If you have a bad mag and you throw it out, destroy it. I mean, physically break the magazine because some cheap bastard's going to go through the garbage can. (laughs) They're going to pull it out. They're going to be like, oh, a free magazine. Cool. This is awesome. And they're going to use it. I've seen it. So Uh, smash them, rip them, put them in a vice, break them, and then throw them away. Right. It might save someone's life. Noted. Um, okay. So the magazines, that's important. If we're, if we're already at this point talking about how magazine inspection is important, then I can only imagine what you guys are going to talk about when we get into the rifles. And while we don't have any pistols out here on the table, I I am curious about pistols as well. But when you talk about the difference, there is a difference between cleaning and maintaining. So now, now walk us through what happens when you guys go through, go through a rifle. How often are you doing this? Are you doing it after every time you shoot it? Are you doing it Monthly, weekly, yearly, and when you check it all out, what are you looking for? What are the common wear items? What do they usually look like when they're worn? I mean, there's a million ways we could go, but but why don't you guys kick it off here? Well, let's see. With with my rifle, um, it, it depends on what I'm doing. So one of the things I do to maintain it a lot is every time I shoot, I'll dump some lube in there. All right, this is this is another big thing we see. Like guys will spend hours cleaning their rifle. You know, like a police officer, load it up, put in a squad, there's no lube on the bolt. Okay. AR, AR-15s absolutely have to have lubrication. If mm-hmm. you get lubrication in there, they will run forever. Good mags, lubrication, you can, you can run this thing for months without cleaning it, okay? yeah. as long as it's lubed. It's like a car engine. You need that oil. You need, need lubrication in there. So I'll, you know, if I'm, if I'm in a class, it's a high round count class, I will dump some lube in there maybe over lunch beforehand. Uh, I don't even have to take the gun apart. I just kind of pull it out of battery, put a little there right behind the bolt, these two holes right there on the bolt carrier, just kind of rack it around there, make sure it's, it's nice and sloppy. So, you're pu- so now when you say when you, the two holes on the bolt carrier, that's where it kind of scallops in where the dust cover ha- kind of... It allows yep, room for the right. dust cover bump to. Yep, right in there. There's two holes there. So when I mean, you say, it's, it's going to get all around in there. Oh, it's anyway. going to get all around, but that's a good spot to put it to have it spread a little bit. Now, yeah. when you say you know dump some lube in there, I I know that there's a lot of folks out there that are under the impression that you need to uh, quote run it wet, and I mean they yeah. they they dump they like lube in there, and it's there you can see the bolt looks soaked. Yeah. Now I've heard that that is not exactly the ideal situation either. Uh, is here's, that, here's I the right thing: if no? you put too much lube in there, it, it's going to take care of itself in a couple minutes. Lube's just going to start flying everywhere, <laughs> and you'll get the right amount. <laughs> uh, a lot of it depends on a lot of it depends on the environment. Like if you're in the deserts of southern Iraq, maybe you don't want to dump a lot. But I will say this: like a dirty. Uh, dry gun runs a lot worse than a, than a dirty wet gun. So if, yep. if 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 you're getting sand and stuff in there, the lubrication is just going to help it run a lot longer. I, okay. I, I've I've seen more. I've never seen a, an issue with a gun that's over lubed. Yeah. I've never seen it. I see issues all the time. Even though even though the lube can be kind of sticky and like dirt and crap can stick to it more than it might if it were drier. Yeah. It, it's it's going to get in there anyway. It is. Okay. It's going to get in there anyway. I. I I don't really recommend ever running a dry gun. The sure, other, yeah, not dry, yeah. The other thing to look at with the AR, too, right, is how are we storing this? You know, I'm going to store it uh, with the dust cover on, the mag in, okay? So, you know, if, if it's going to be, uh, you know, say a squad car or something like that, right, or in a squad rack, right? Um, so you are limiting, to some extent, what's going to get in there. Gotcha. Um, you know, 
I, I don't recommend if people storm in a case, foam case, I don't recommend, um, you know, leaving, uh, leaving the mag out, leaving the dust cover open because that, that foam degrades and then, yeah, it's going to get in there. But, gotcha. you know, yeah, I've seen that before. Up. They almost, and I mean, it just, like you said, it's it like almost turns to dust. Yeah. 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 Yep. Exactly. N- you know, you were talking oh, about. I got to go into my cases. <laughs> 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 you're talking about environmental conditions like the desert what about like a marine environment what does a person have to worry about there i mean because i know when i've i've done on a few coastal type hunts where you're um you know close contact with salt water getting in and out of boats <laughs> <I thought you're laughs> uh, so we're talking about ar-15s you brought in the marine environment i was like mark you you going after pirates <laughs> <laughs> These are, so and this would be a bolt gun sure but, right okay yeah a uh, big thing you got to worry about there is is saltwater corrosion all right you got you got to wipe that thing dry afterwards you know um you don't have to necessarily scrub anything but you got to get the water you got to get that stuff off of there okay and maybe even add like a light film of a lubricant like overexposed metal afterwards that's what i was could you buy even pre adding a lubricant or or an oil could you prevent some from that, I guess, ever happening. Like, I guess, and I didn't, right? And it didn't take long, and you, you got all sorts of rust going on. I mean, yeah. like, a day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no. certainly. Uh, you know, one of the things before we changed our maintenance program at our department, what I would see is officers, they'd get uh, deployed with their rifles, and they always stayed in the squad cars. So when they were done, rifle might be wet because it was raining. They'd put it back in the squad car, and it would sit there. So now you have a wet gun that sits for weeks and weeks, maybe months, and eventually things start to rust. And we would find occasionally rifles which had bolts rusted to the uh, bolt lugs or to the barrel extensions Whoa. inside um, inside the guns. So even though the even though the in- interior of that uh, chamber is chrome lined, yep. it's just that the bolt itself the is bolt rusted. itself yep. yep would rust. And that's another thing to say about lube is. Uh, lubrication will evaporate over time. So just because okay. you lube your gun, gotcha. you go put it on the rack or you put it in your car or whatever, yeah. doesn't mean every few weeks or at least once th- once a month. I mean, you got to check on that thing. And if you notice, hey, it's dry, put some more lube on it. Yeah. So. Yeah, some- definitely. If, and if you if the rifle gets wet from rain, m- make sure that dries out. Yeah. Wipe it down best you can. I know it's kind of hard sometimes with a, with a hand guard like this. Like I don't really want to take this hand guard. Hand guard yeah, yeah, full length hand guard. I don't really want to take this off. I have a laser aiming device here that's zeroed to it. But if you can just dump a little lube in there, okay, wipe down what you can. You should be able to limit it. Because yeah, yeah, the other thing that lube has a tendency to do is, too is once it's on metal, a lot of the metals that we're dealing with on AR-15, especially the barrel, I've noticed, uh, are actually fairly porous. Yeah. And so lube has a tendency to once you put it on there, it kind of dissipates and spreads around. So if you can, you don't have to get it on every single surface. If you can't always reach one surface, it'll probably wind up seeping its way through to that point. Yeah. When you put that lube in to the, I mean, are you cycling that yeah. several times put to kind of move it around cycle a little bit? It a couple times. Okay. Rack, 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 and uh, yeah. If you put too much, it's gonna fi- it, it'll go everywhere, and, and you know. Problem solved, but I've, I yeah. <laughs> you get a face full of oil or two for your first shots. And yeah, then, uh, you kind of learn yeah. through experience how much you need. How much you need. Yeah. Okay. So what else are you looking at then? Aside from aside from making sure that you've got proper lubrication on, I, I imagine most of the moving parts, you're just going to want to properly lubricate. Right. Uh, what other kind of uh, what other kind of stuff are you doing when you're maintaining? More specifically, so reference. this is kind of uh, applicable to us because we all work in an optics company. But uh, you know, I I'll, I'll watch a guy clean his rifle for four hours, never touches the glass. All right, mm-hmm. all our optics come with these nice microfiber uh, wipes. They're awesome. Wipe down the your your glass. All right, yeah. You, you can't a canned air. Yeah, I mean to to shoot, you have to see something. If you have filth, you know, uh, on the lens, wipe that off. I would I would rather I. You know, my optics are clean. My gun's filthy, but my optics are clean because I need to use that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I do that. Um, Can we also talk about it too? Let's let's bring up one thing. This is this is my own personal um, mission, if you will: battery and maintenance on an illuminated optic. So, red dot or an, an optic that you depend on for illumination. Like, for example, you have a Razor One to Six in front of us, which is you know has the daylight bright dot. That's that's something that's intended to be used for more than just low light shooting. Um, a lot of people will wait until the battery dies to change it. Yeah. Rather than kind of uh, establishing a sequence for battery maintenance, 
which is is baffling to me because a battery, <laughs> a CR twenty thirty two battery, you can get a pack of four for less than two dollars, and if you're getting the really high quality stuff, it's less than three dollars, and um, which you'd recommend. I mean, it is good to use a high quality battery, but yep. that's something you can change. For me, like six months. Yeah, that's that's just a no brainer. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about six dollars a year. And that's for a pack. We're really, like I said, you can pay three dollars and probably have four batteries. But just switching them out like that, it it saves you any potential of having it go down at the worst time. And then the other thing is too is it's like I, I guess I've heard some people say at times, you know, where it's like, well, I just want to be able to stick it in my safe and have it be on when I need it someday down the line. And I always think to myself, holy smokes. If you haven't used your rifle for 50,000 hours <laughs> and all of a sudden a bad guy breaks into your house and tries, you know, to to do something and you re- need to rely on that rifle that you have not touched for 50,000 hours or more nowadays, you know. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm I hope I don't rely on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting because I see a lot of people who who show up either at our facility or when we do training outside of our facility, um, uh, oftentimes professionals who carry a gun every day um, for work, and they show up for training, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, their light's dead or their optic is dead. Um, these are things that need to be checked. Like you can't assume that your weapon is just good to go because when you put it in the rack two months ago, it was good to go then. Right. Um, you know, I would teach patrol officers every single day. You're checking your light. You're checking your optic. Um, you're checking the condition of your of your weapon. You need to know that it's ready to go. Um, so I mean, it's like every time you fly or a person flies an airplane, they they do yeah. a walk around. Yeah, you this know? is life saving equipment. Is right. what this is. Yeah. So yeah, I, the, I mean, a gun. You're just hip shooting if you don't have an optic at that point. I mean, right. and especially with a red dot, there's there's no point of aim. I mean, sure, you got these backup iron sights, but when was the last time you flipped up your backup iron sights and started, you know? It's it's a simple <laughs> simple right. insurance to to replace your battery every now and then. And the yeah. thing is, too, people look at you know some of the optics and they say, yeah, it's got five thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand hour battery life. Well, yeah, but you might have gotten a bad battery too, and yeah. you just put it in, and now a few months later, yeah. it's dead. So the chemistry of batteries is is ultimately the limiting factor, which which far too many people I think don't don't realize. And as battery life continues to improve more and more, uh, it, it it ultimately it doesn't matter. There's a certain point where it doesn't matter. How efficient the red dot is because your battery the chemistry of that battery is that the battery is going to break down and no longer work so your battery might be efficient enough or your red dot might be fi- efficient enough or illuminated reticle might be efficient enough to last a billion hours there's no battery on the face of the planet that can last a billion hours anyway i felt like throwing that one out there uh and also um please if you're going to rely on a firearm with an optic on it to potentially save your life life please utilize it and train with it and don't let the time that the bad guy breaks in uh be the first time you've touched it in fifty thousand hours uh okay sorry commercial over <laughs> um, so continue on so we talked about the optical a bit and you're you're headed into some more uh, wear items and things like that that you're checking so that's daily use I, I clean my optics pretty much daily every time i shoot the gun i i add lubrication to it and and for me that's that's kind of about it yeah um you know, and and this is an extremely reliable rifle. Like people seem to think, oh, if you don't clean your rifle, it's 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 not going to work. That's not true. Mm-hmm. It's not true. The, the carbon in there has nothing to do. As long as you lubricate the rifle, it has nothing to do with how it's going to operate. Um, typically, I, I, the running joke down on the range is, I, I'll I'll clean and inspect my rifle. I know when it's time when I start opening doors and I'm leaving black streaks on all the doors. I'm like, okay, <laughs> time time to start wiping this thing down. Um, I'll just I'll take it apart. I wipe it down. I, I check springs. Um, I'll take apart the bolt. I'll check the extractor. Make sure the hooks still have a little bit of an edge to them. Um, I check the ejector. How do you how do you check to make so how do you check springs first off? I mean I I don't. Well, make sure you they're just, there. You just make sure they're there. Right. Have you ever had a? Have you ever opened up a rifle and just been like, "There is no spring there." Uh, well, I mean, hey, law enforcement. You know, you get somebody who doesn't really tinkers with their gun. Tinkers with their gun, and 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 now that you know, um, extractor springs missing, the rifle's not going to work. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 
and and so okay, so you're looking you're looking for that, and then things like extractors and stuff like that. You mentioned that making sure the extractor still has an edge on it. How do you do that? Do, How do you do? You want to take apart the clean yeah, rifle? If I we take this that. thing apart, we it's, a, uh, it's <laughs> we're gonna create a mess. It's gonna here get nasty. Takes, yeah. Which one's the clean rifle? The uh, it's gonna be the one with the razor. On the it, razor yeah. on it. And I've got All a little right. checklist. This is kind of what we went through oh, okay. uh, when we did our full. Full, I'm saying biannual inspections of our ARs. I don't do this every single time I clean a gun. Yeah. So, all right. So, let me get this out of here. How did you, you know, one thing I was just going to say, too, is because I was looking over the rifle. And we were talking about, you know, like the optic. That's something that could be life-saving thing. It, it, the, the rifle depends on it. The mount. I mean, the, the lubrication, um, barrel, all that stuff. I just realized, though, that, you know, you guys have rifles here that have a lot of gizmos and gadgets. We've mm -hmm. got... Uh, laser sighting devices, lights, night vision, uh, uh, ca capable, compatible things. There's the word. Uh, you've got tape switches. You've got grip panels. You've got all kinds of quick release swings, sling swivels, optics, mounts. I just realized that not a single item on this rifle, uh, could you do without, essentially. You know, uh... Something goes wrong with your buttstock. I mean, sure, maybe it'll still work, but you're not going to be as accurate necessarily or as quick or whatever. Or, you know, these grip panels you put on here for a reason. You definitely want to check basically everything. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's well, and, and that's a good note. That's a good point. I mean, it, certainly for us, just kind of the, the way we shoot, the way we train our backgrounds is that everything on our rifle, you know, has a purpose. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think in general, everything we do, everything we teach, we want to have a purpose for doing it. So, yeah. Um, otherwise, you're just hauling around extra weight. But so this bolt is out of here now. Yeah, I kind of this is a nice table. I don't want to get it all greasy and dirty. Oh well, hey, stuff, that's why but, we put it in here. <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, the bolt, the bolt, the bolt carrier group is really the heart of the rifle, right? Yeah. This is where you know um, cycle of operations is going to happen. You're feeding, you're chambering, uh, you're extracting, you're ejecting. If something's going to go wrong with the rifle, it's it's probably going to be yeah. going to be in here. And you buy it as one piece usually from a from an online retailer or something like that, but there are many pieces within the yes, bolt carrier Yes, group. indeed. Yes, indeed. And, you know, and when you do buy them, um, you know, there's a bazillion different manufacturers out there. Um, they're not all created equal. And, and people have this idea that, oh, AR-15s are all mil-spec, right? Just because the parts are interchangeable doesn't mean that they're mil-spec. Like, mil-spec refers to a very specific uh, uh, type of uh, manufacturing, the quality of the materials, how things are uh, inspected for uh, defects and things like that. So there's a lot more to um, what's really mil spec than Here's just Matt. than Can just parts Ryan. interchangeability. There see we Ryan go. came in. Cool. Saving the day. Excellent. I feel much better now. There we go. So yeah, so I mean so like this rifle, I just cleaned this rifle and uh, it was dirty before. I mean it had probably a couple thousand rounds through it, right? Um, so it took me about twenty minutes to clean it. So a lot of people might spend an hour or two. You don't need to spend that much time. So okay. basically, uh, you know, when I'm going to clean or take a look at this rifle, first thing I'm going to do, obviously, I'm going to make sure that it's unloaded, okay? Um, and then I'm going to pop out the bolt and the bolt carrier group, and I'm, I'm going to disassemble it, all right? So I'm gonna all right. pull out my firing tin, pin retainer there, my firing pin, my bolt lug. My bolt. Oh, I forgot to start, uh, start the stopwatch. So if you could just. Oh, oh yeah, sure, sure. We'll put, <laughs> it, put it back together here. <laughs> no, right? I'm joking. Then I'm just going to use this little pin here and I'm going to pop up my extractor. Extractor, super important uh, part that is often overlooked. So or you just use the retention pin. So for use the retention the pin. Uh, yep. I don't like that. using the firing pin because you can chip the end of your firing pin. You, I see a lot of people using the firing pin for that stuff. I want that firing pin. Firing to, pin is pretty essential. It is. I mean, yeah. all you have to do is say the name, and then you kind of realize uh, firing pin. It kind of is responsible. It's kind of for important. Firing. So yeah. So I mean, the extractor and a lot of these parts, honestly, um, they're going to wear based on how many rounds you put through the gun. All right. So it's hard to say. Well, you should replace this every six months. You should clean this every three months. Right. Um, it all depends on how much you shoot. So mm -hmm. um, there are some there are some kind of ballpark ideas. I don't know if there's anything official or what you know military or, or really high end units teach, but you know a bolt. I've heard anywhere from replacing what five thousand to seven thousand rounds or yeah. something like that. Um, you know, oh. you know extractors. Um, some companies make some pretty cool uh, rebuild kits that come with an extractor. Comes with new gas rings, um, new extractor spring. You know every. You know, when you replace the bolt or every 5,000 rounds, something like that. Do you guys, do you guys try that? and keep track of how many rounds you're putting down range? 
it's hard to do with, yeah. how, with how much we shoot. Yeah. Um, I ballpark it. You yeah. know, there's really not a good system out there for now. So, um, so people, people when they rebuild a, uh, even just the bolt. So there's a bolt carrier group, which looks like a big giant sled, mm-hmm. and then there's the actual bolt, which is dramatically smaller. But yeah. you just said, yeah. So do people even take this apart further when they rebuild? One? Yeah, absolutely. So these so uh, gas rings. These gas rings. Yep, these gas rings can come off. Um, so I don't take them off to clean them because you really don't need to. They're uh, like a gasket or like a. They're like a piston ring on a car. Okay. So that's a common misconception. People say, "Oh, I gotta l- make sure all these all these gaps are not lined up, right? Or gas is gonna escape through." It's not how they work. They're like a piston ring on a car. So this sits inside of the uh, 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 bolt carrier group here, and when it slides. Uh, back and forth in the bolt carrier group, those rings close up like this, just like a piston ring on a car. Mm. So doesn't matter. I guess if it makes you feel good, if you're OCD, fine. But I don't pull them off because you're more likely to do damage to these pulling them on and off. Okay. Just wipe it off. Okay. Um, wipe it off. Wipe don't it off. Scrape don't anything. scrape it off. So you'll notice, and, and folks watching won't be able to see. So I just cleaned this gun, and you'll see on that tail of the bolt, there's still plenty of carbon on there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I didn't scrape it with anything. This carbon isn't going to affect how your gun runs. And as soon as you start shooting it again, the carbon's going to build up there again. In the, In the army, army it right? did. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I tell you what I saw. Did you try explaining that, Pete? Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I saw at my, my agency with the older guns we had. Because guys were from the military. They learned you got to get all the carbon off. So that's what the department did, too, right? With the older guns that had been scraped clean like that over the years, you would start, so all the finish would be worn off the tail of the bolt here, and you would start seeing serious pitting um, in here, and that would weaken the bolt. And we actually had a couple that this actually failed at this point because they had been scrubbed and scraped so much, they cor- they corrode and then they break. What happens at the point when that portion of the bolt breaks? I mean, does the whole thing, is it, do you end up getting like a jam or do you end up getting like Yeah, a, you, you could. I mean, because now you have a piece floating around in there. I mean, the right. gun is probably going to stop the, functioning. The lugs, just, yeah. the lugs will break off. I, I have seen guns that will still run missing a lug. Yes. As long as that lug gets outside the gun, it'll still function, and, and they don't realize it until they, they go to take it apart. Okay. I have seen a couple function. So after I wipe this off, yep, I'm looking, and, and the, the two main lugs where you're going to have problems are right on the... Uh, sides of the extractor. So I'm going to take a look at those. I'm going to look for any little cracks I can see. So those are the kind of the top. They're a little bit less supported, aren't they? Exactly. Because there's that gap there where yep. the extractor sits. Exactly. Then the other place I'm really going to look is I'm going to look at this this uh, cam pin hole because that'll be a place where you'll start getting cracks and stuff like that too. So. Okay. So when you pulled this one apart, did you find you know everything to be good? Have yep. you pulled ones apart before? Well, it sounds like probably you have pulled them oh, apart yeah. before where there's you're oh, starting sure. to get cracks. Yep, and stuff. absolutely. Yep, and if you can see the crack there, then you're going to take it out of service right away. Replace it before you have a catastrophic failure. Yeah. When you replace a bolt, do you also? I mean, is it necessary to replace a, the whole carrier, or can you just buy the bolt and, sl- and throw it in the carriers? Carrier? Carriers will last a long time. So the only thing you really got to watch on the carrier is your gas key here, right? We want to make sure that that's staked. That's not loose. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, if if it is, you you can buy a new carrier. You can torque it down. You can. You have to put a gasket material in between the bolt carrier and the bolt carrier group. Um, I've done a couple of them just for kicks, but honestly, you might as well just buy a whole new bolt carrier group. It's you're gonna unless you really know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's just not worth the 150 bucks or whatever they cost um, to risk it, in my opinion. Yeah. So, um. But yeah, so that's, that's so you one checked of the, all that. How are you checking the edge on this extractor? That's one thing. So Pete said. again, well, it's just kind of one of those those, those feel things. Yeah, I just want to feel like there's kind of almost feels like two little kitten teeth. Yeah, you know, feeling you kind of oh kitten teeth, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't, know. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, they're little, they're like <laughs> tiny little sharp teeth. <laughs> Bat, you are now going to be quoted on that one, <laughs> right? Oh, oh, now I'm following you. Yep. Yeah, because oh, the, the uh, oh, cute. Oh, yeah, the little, the little kitten teeth. No, actually, Adrian's that's, new that... name is Kitten Teeth. Kitten Teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, no, it didn't quite didn't quite register with me at first, but now I haven't now found I see them what you're yet. Saying. Where are they? No, okay. So I, at first, I looked at it and I thought the extractor was flat. But it's it's dished, and on either seat right here, 
either oh. end of it. There's like a tooth. It, it reminds me of what I would rather say would be like looking at the open mouth of a rattlesnake, but far less dramatic. Ah. Kind of have that arch <laughs> between the two big fangs. rattlesnake fangs. See, rattlesnake there we go. Fangs. Rattlesnake would be a lot cooler nickname than, than kittens. T- <laughs> kitten <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that ship has sailed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with dragon face. Okay. There we go. There dragon we go. Face, rattlesnake mouth. <laughs> oh, I got you it's now. Even got the eye. Yeah, it's even. Yeah. So oh, that yeah. that's yeah, a very important part. It. Without that. Um, you're not getting that round out of the chamber. Yeah. Okay. If 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 that extractor is busted, um, that round's not getting extracted. It's not getting yeah. ejected. Now here's here's a question for you guys. So this this is going to relate to bolt guns. Now my question, but bolt guns also have extractors. They have bolts. Um, and Adrian, being a sniper, you could probably speak to this quite a bit as well. Um, but I've seen sometimes where people actually, they have an extractor, but the extractor is too strong in a way, mm. or it grabs onto the bullet too tightly, or, or maybe it's not that that's happening. Maybe it's something else happening in the chamber where the bullet's getting, uh, getting kind of, uh, jammed too much or whatever. But I've seen where all of a sudden extractors start, start ripping oh, sure. things well, apart. And you can get that in ARs too. Is that? Um, and oftentimes, um, I get the extreme. I remember somebody, somebody's extractor, I recall, was like ripping apart, ripping up probably the case, the case, case rim. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, in a bolt gun, and I, I'm not an expert when it comes to bolt gun maintenance by any means. So, okay. um, you know, in my experience, when I've seen stuff like that with bolt guns, um, you know, usually uh, that could be that you have some crud or crap in your chamber, and it's you know too dirty, and you're getting you're getting around that stuck in there. Um, with ARs, it can be more of a timing issue. So. I mean, the way basically an AR works, right, um, that bullet is fired, the gas uh, goes down the uh, the barrel, and then it comes back up through a gas tube. That gas tube leads to your gas carrier, starts moving your bolt back, your bolt unlocks, and then it starts trying to extract that shell from the chamber, right? Yep. If the pressure in your chamber is too high, oh, all right, okay. all that pressure in the inside of the case is going to be pushing that case out against the chamber walls, all right? So if you haven't had enough time for the pressure in the chamber to drop by venting gas out the barrel, right? Um, then your extractor is fighting against that, gotcha. pre- that pressure. And that's oftentimes when you'll see cases getting ripped. So oftentimes what the answer is there is to try to slow down the, the cyclic rate of the gun by putting like a heavier buffer or something like that hmm. um, inside your gun. It could also be uh, an issue with a gun that's, you know, doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, gas port to spec or, or some other issue with the with the gas system. Does that have anything to do with when people have a certain length barrel with a certain length gas system, like a carbine mid length, rifle length? Yeah, it, it could. It could. You know, the different the different length of gas systems are gonna produce uh, you know, different chamber pressures and it's gonna depend on your barrel and your gas system length and things like that. So that's why like this is a 14 and a half inch gun, but it's got a mid-length gas system on it. And then I have uh, I have an A5 buffer system in here, so it's got a heavier uh, uh, buffer. So it's just going to slow down the cyclic rate a little bit. It's going to give more time for that uh, chamber pressure to drop, for that gas to escape, and uh, provide a little bit more reliable hmm. uh, operation. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. So you checked all that stuff out on... Your rifle. Now, does that pretty much do it for most of the maintenance? Like, and and then and then replacing things if need be. Uh, is is most of that want coming down to the bolt and then just inspection of things, making sure stuff's not rusted, pitted, whatever. Yeah, that's about ninety percent of it, right there. Yeah, B- big portion. Now, yeah. uh, over here on this firearm, you're running a. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. But there's one over here, and I think this one must be Pete's. Must be the ultra filthy one. This must be the medium one. That's right. That's right. Uh, this has a suppressor on the end of it. And we actually just got done talking with Ruben and Adam about suppressors. And in cases of rifles especially, actually they mentioned that sometimes uh, if, a, if a can, uh, the rifle cans tend to not really need a whole lot of uh, maintenance, if you will. You know, in fact, the best way to clean one out, in theory, would be to just shoot it a bunch because it's going to burn all the crud out of there. Is there anything else, though, as far as, like, do you ever check this mounting system for the suppressor, or do you do anything else to ensure we're not getting, like, baffle strikes or something like that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I'm obviously I'm going to make sure that the the mounting system is uh, is all cleaned up and stuff like that. So when I did clean this gun, this one will also take that same Surefire can. You know, I wipe that off. I make sure that I don't have a bunch of, again, I'm not scraping stuff, but I'm just making sure I don't have a bunch of carbon baked on okay. it, right? Okay. Um, just because I want that mounting surface to be nice and solid. Yeah. They do make um, uh, alignment, you know, gauges that you can check your 
uh, suppressor to your barrel to uh, to make sure that everything's aligned well. Um, you know, with a good quality can, the Surefire can, I've never seen any problems with them. So it's something I guess I, I really don't worry about cool. uh, with that. But the one thing with the cans is that they are going to make your guns get dirtier faster, right? Um, you get more gas that backs up into the into the AR, the rest of the system here with the ARs. So this gun, I do wipe it down a little bit more frequently. I do clean it more frequently. I have to oil it Air more quotes. frequently. Yeah, yep. You know, and, and my cleaning, like as we said, my cleaning consists of me, uh, you know, spraying some stuff on things, wiping it off the paper towel. I mean, it's clean, but it's not white glove clean. Yeah. You know, I'm not scraping stuff off, so... Oh, I forgot to ask you guys this a little bit uh, a little while back when we were talking about lubrication, too. What kind of lubrication are you guys using? I'm sure this is one where as soon as you guys say an answer, somebody's going to have an issue with it, I'm sure. Wet. Um, just <laughs> wet. It's going to be so contentious. Water. No, I'm just kidding. Not water. I, I, oh. I, I did know a guy who used, uh, kind of as a joke, he was making a point. He used Vagisil and ran an AR <laughs> for a while. Um, uh, honestly, we don't... Noted. Point, point taken. <laughs> Noted. Uh, I honestly, I have no preference when it comes to lubricant. Yeah. Um, stay away from the real thin, like, can, like, rem oil or what's WD-40. Stay away from stuff like that. It oh, needs to right. be kind of thick, some viscosity. Um, there's a lot of really good manufacturers out there. As long as you're not using military CLP, it should work just fine. <laughs> I mean, I I, had, I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, you know, are we talking, are we talking motor oil? I mean, could you? I, I have used synthetic motor oil on yeah, my ARs before. That's what I use, but it's one of those things where I realize there's probably a million other things I could use. Yeah. Just, yeah. That, that was what I I, re- I recommend a good synthetic, you know, firearms lubricant. Um, I personally don't like things. You know, there's some lubricants out there where you have to, like, you put it on, and then you have to heat it up with a heat gun and this and that. Like, I, no. Like, I, I just like a, a standard uh, standard synthetic uh, lubricant, high quality lubricant. Yeah. Um, you know, CLP is one of those things like it does kind of everything okay. Like it cleans okay, it lubricates okay, it protects okay, but it really doesn't do anything, you know, really good. It's going to evaporate over time. Okay. It's a little thin. Um, you know, you can, I use it for cleaning if it's around. I'll use it for lubrication if that's what I got, but you're going to have to reapply it a little bit more frequently, you know, yeah. for, for lubrication. Yeah. So. When it comes to pistols, are you guys generally doing kind of the same thing? Does it vary based on the type of pistol or? or? I would say there's a difference if you're running, say, like a 1911 with really tight tolerances versus running a Glock. I mean, you know. What some, are the tight tolerances? What problems does that cause? Just getting dirty and just having well, yeah, you get, get you get more up. stuff. You know, you get you get the sand in there. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't know. You can probably speak to that more than I can about, you know, some of the, the 1911 issues over the over the years and, you know, military units and whatnot. But, yeah, I mean, you get sand, you get dirt in there. Uh, there's just less room for it to go. So it's going to bind things up, you know, more um, versus, say, you're running, a, you know, a more modern pistol, a Glock or an M&P or something like that. Um, you, you can get those, you know, those can be pretty dirty and still run. Um, you know, and at the same time, too, you got to look at your application, right? Is this a gun that I am going to, you know, trust my life to all the time? When I carry this as a police officer, um, I cleaned it more often than I did now because I'm shooting it all the time now. It's going to get dirty tomorrow, um, you know, whereas now I'll let it go several thousand rounds before I wipe it down. I probably wouldn't let it go as far when, like, this was my, my go-to gun. But uh, at the same time, I wasn't cleaning it. If I went out and shot 50 rounds with the department, I wasn't going to take it apart and clean it either. I'd throw some lube on it, and it's good to go. Do you think anything? Do you think there's anything to be said about the fact that you guys are shooting pretty frequently? Um, Do guns just work better when they're used more? Like, is there anything to be said? Like, I I know in in I'll throw out more of my quintessential car references. Like a car that sits for a long time is not near. I would so much rather if I were looking for a used car. I'd so much rather go out and find a car that was well maintained and well used, yeah. was driven frequently, than if I found some person who bought it new off the showroom and then just had it sit dormant. Does yeah, that have anything to do with it? Or do you think there. guns are a little bit? I, yeah, maybe. I, I think the gun that's been shot, like if it had any issue, it would have cropped up right away. Right. You know, if it there was a faulty part, known. it would have made itself known. I, I, I know this gun is 100% reliable. I mean, if. And it gets to the point, if I do have a malfunction, the world, everything kind of stops, you know, because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's such a rare thing. Um, I know 
sometimes the law enforcement will be standing on the line and, and guys are having problems with their pistols and, and like, you know, hold on, what happened there? Oh, I just had a malfunction. You know, and they'll have two like in, in, in a magazine or two. And like, to me, that's not acceptable ever. Like yeah. the world stops. Like yeah. we need to take that gun apart. We need to figure out what's going on. And I think sometimes people just accept malfunctions as part of life. I mean, it'll happen. But uh, I, if I have them, I, I, okay, magazine's gone, you know, I'm, I'm looking over my gun, I'll, I'll take it apart, you know. That's one of the reasons I don't really take my gun apart a lot now is because it works all the time. It's 100% reliable. Hmm. Yeah, we kind of have zero tolerance for malfunctions. And it's amazing how many people just accept that as like, oh, it's part of shooting, it's part of training, I'm going to have a malfunction. It's like, no, you shouldn't. You if just call time out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, you're running, if you're running reliable Sir. equipment, taking care yeah. of it, your gun shouldn't malfunction. Okay. If it does, something's not right. If your car doesn't start, it's kind of a big deal to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're hey, w- what happened? Mm-hmm. You know, but for whatever reason, people will accept a you know a couple malfunctions here and there with their with their handguns or their rifles. Yeah, yeah. Well, firearm maintenance. What do you say we jump into some last calls here? Does that sound good, Mark? Or did you have anything else? Well, I don't. I mean, well, here's what I was going to say, and I know we're bumping on that hour mark. We're talking about firearms maintenance. Did we want to talk about? I guess I had some questions. I think oftentimes when people think about firearms maintenance, they are thinking about cleaning. Yes. And I guess I had a couple questions in do regards it, do to it, cleaning. Mark. Yeah, shoot. I mean, we already covered a couple things. You know, I had some questions written down here. How often do you clean? You know, what, what are you removing and why is it important? I guess. Yeah. I mean, when I do clean my gun, I am, I am wiping off the loose carbon. Um, loose dirt, anything like that. Um, you know, how often, uh, when it needs it. When I when I look in there, I'm like, eh, it's getting pretty dirty. Or if I'm ever shooting, and sometimes with the ARs, you can feel the cyclic rate. You just feel like, eh, it's mm-hmm. getting a little tough there. Maybe I'll dump some oil on it. Maybe I'll be like, okay, it's, it's time to give it a little bit of a clean. Like I said, when I was in law enforcement, I try to clean it about every 500 rounds to maybe a thousand max. And would, I mean, would that be? I mean, you're and, including the barrel in that as well. Yeah, right? yeah, and 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 that's true. I, we kind of just covered on the bolt, but I mean, I have the gun apart, so I take the buffer out, the bu- um, the spring. I'd wipe it down, relube it. Um, same thing. I'd run a couple patches. You're down, lubing your down buffer in spring as well. Just a little bit, very, very, uh, very, very light coat. Yeah, yeah, very, very light coat. Um, and then I'm also inspecting things like the charging handle, little things like that, making sure that you know where the pin and the latch connect. That that pin isn't shearing off or anything. Mm-hmm. So is this little guy that grabs into the portion on the upper receiver? Does that ever wear down to where? Yeah, it I have. Lock up I have seen the actual little hook on the uh, on the um, charging handle latch. Yeah, uh, break mm-hmm. as well. So yeah. Hmm. Hmm. What about um, like like material or materials? Like as far as like you know um, your cleaning rod, types of brushes. I've seen all sorts of different types of you got brass. You've got um, you know other materials. Uh, are there ones that you prefer? Not really, personally. I mean, I've heard different things from different people. Some people say, you want to use a soft, like a carbon or a brass cleaning rod, right, so it doesn't scratch things. But then other people say, well, no, if you use that, then you're going to get little pieces of metal embedded on it, and it's going to scratch things. Mm-hmm. So honestly, uh, with my ARs or my precision rifles, I haven't noticed a difference. Um, some people will say, avoid steel, because that will potentially scratch things. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't. I don't know if it makes a big difference personally. Uh, honestly, this is a chrome lined barrel. I, I just run a bore snake down it. A okay, I was going to ask about that yeah. as well. Yeah, I just run a bore snake yeah. down it a couple yeah. times, and and that's it. I I think like if I sit there with metal cr- cleaning rods and I keep running it down there, I'm actually causing more more damage than I'm I'm trying to prevent. Yeah, I was going to ask that too, actually, about barrel maintenance, so to speak. Yeah, so a couple a uh, couple of bore snakes down there. How does one tell? If there's ever starting to become an issue with a with a barrel, how does it shoot? Yeah, um, I just had a, an AR. It's a BCM upper. I probably had forty to fifty thousand rounds through it, and I noticed it wasn't holding the the groups that I expected out of it. And I kind of did the math: how many rounds I've shot every month over the last you know six seven years, and realized eh, this barrel's probably you know, starting to get toward the end of its service life. Down so to that pretty much tighten right back up once you put a new barrel on it? Yeah, yeah. So I just switched uppers, you know, went uh, went shooting and, and saw that the different upper was shooting a lot better. So I haven't put a new barrel on it yet, but I will uh, new barrel and then also replace the bolt at the same time. Start with a new barrel, new bolt, and she should be good to go. 
Have you ever had a dirty barrel be kind of that same culprit, though, where your groups start to open up a little bit and you clean it and they tighten back up? Not really on an AR-15. In a precision rifle. In a precision, in a precision rifle. rifle. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, precision rifle I have. You yep. actually find that in some pre- in precision rifle you actually shoot better with a clean barrel? Personally, I find, and this is my own experience, and, and people have different experiences, of course, um, I find that my guns seem to shoot better when they get a little bit of fouling in them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely when they build up uh, a copper uh, copper uh, on the inside. Um, I very rarely strip copper from any of my precision rifle barrels. Okay. Um, but after a few hundred rounds, I might notice that, okay, yeah, I'm starting to get a flyer every now and then. So then I'll just run a typical hop, poppies number nine or something like that. Um, clean it out that way, but I won't. I usually won't touch copper in my barrel. I won't mm. use any copper strippers. Yeah, if if you do clean your barrel, you know, I guess entirely, or you know, strip the copper out. How how much do you need to shoot through to actually refoul the barrel to kind of get to that optimal performance? Oh, yeah. Like, is that one shot? Is it we kind of tried to get that out shots? of Ian? I feel like, but he he gave us a very nerdy <laughs> yeah. engineering yeah. scientific yeah. example. I, I don't know. Yeah, and yeah. I'm not I'm not an engineering nerd, so um, I, geez, I don't know. I'm trying to think the last time. Um, I stripped one of my department rifles full of copper, and I noticed I was getting more flyers. The groups were, were um, opening up. I probably shot another, at least another 100 rounds through it before I really felt confident again that the okay, round yeah. rounds were going to go where I wanted them to. Yeah. yeah. So. And then, Pete, you brought up that boar snake. I'm kind of ripping through kind of like my list of things here. You no, it, it, Mark, it's all right. I just I, I want to I throw out the caveat that the only reason I was really excited to jump into last calls is because I didn't want anybody to steal mine. I'm just gonna say right now. I'm not gonna that steal my it. ultimate takeaway from this is just get an AK-47. All right. <laughs> oh, oh man, jeez, we could have another Ooh. podcast. It's funny when they're talking about tolerances. I was like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's where I was <laughs> trying to go. That's where I was trying to go. Okay. Anyway, I'll have to come up with a new last call. But I did want to. I did want to throw that out there for folks who were like, "What the heck's up with this guy rushing us out of this podcast?" <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now I'm, and now I'm good. Um, you brought up the boar snake, which that's kind of like a breach two muzzle right. system you know you, I, i've seen i guess both systems intuitively that makes sense to me right because you're pulling you know that debris outside of you know really where a lot of the important things happen whether it's a bolt gun or ar i guess what are your thoughts on that when you see like that muzzle to breach or is there one better or muzzle to breach uh the one problem you run into there and it's not as big with ARs because you've got usually you know a muzzle device on the gun here but um with bolt guns you know when we're talking really uh accurate guns you always risk uh, uh run the risk of damaging the crown of right. the barrel and that's the last point where the barrel comes into contact with the yeah. bullet and you have gas escaping around the bullet as it's leaving the barrel so man i i think it's kind of uh the age old advice clean um you know, clean from the breech to the muzzle. And so okay, I yeah. think in general that's a yeah. good idea, just across the board. I've got a, uh, I've got a high point 9 mil carbine, and at the end of the barrel, the rifling kind of, you know, got pushed out a little bit, so there's, like, these little nubs on uh, at, at the end of all the rifling on the end of the barrel. Uh, it's I found, Speed I, nubs? I call that, the, uh, I've heard someone call it the accurizers. <laughs> 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 it's just that last kind of, you know, it's the, it's the touch. It's the, um, it's the English that somebody would put on the basketball right before they're yeah. about to do nice. that the shot. Last, you know? The last finger of the quarterback's that finger nice. roll. on the football. Uh, but yeah, that's why I always go breach to muzzle so that we don't mess up my accurizers. Okay. Good deal. <laughs> Good deal. I think that's all I really had in regards to that. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. I, um, how about we'll do we'll do the actual last calls now because now we are at an hour. Uh, but we'll have um, well, we should start because our guests always do the best last calls. Guys, last calls just like anything that's on your mind as we're as we're closing out. That's mildly related. Um, but uh, but mine would be I'm trying to avoid probably what will be the uh, inevitable uh, last call, which is just you should maintain your firearms. Um, I definitely have to go back and check a lot of my guns. I find I, I, I'll, my last call will be a question to you guys. So in your in your experience, one of my issues that I have is like I get done shooting at the range, and usually I'm trying to scrape every last minute that I can out of like actually shooting. And then when I'm like, okay, I definitely have to go back and get dinner with the wife now. Uh, I like throw everything in the bag and I bring it all and I chuck it in the truck and then I'm leaving in a frenzy and I get home and I throw everything down. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's go out to dinner. Hopefully I've washed my hands at some point in the middle of all that. 
and uh, so I don't get lead poisoning from the burritos we go out and eat. But um, what do you guys do when you're in, like, are there any just absolutely bare minimum things that you guys do in a hurry? Or have you established any sort of uh, routines where it just doesn't take that long for you guys at this point? Uh, just as if you're, you know, cause I'm thinking to myself, like every foam case I've ever thrown a gun in, I didn't close the dust cover, no. you know, like I just left things as they were. My optics are dirty, are dirty as heck and I work in an optics company. Yeah. Um, honestly it, for me, like a, a range day, if I'm outdoors and it's raining, I would at least try to wipe it down. I don't want that water getting in there, sitting on, sitting it. on it. Uh, that leads to corrosion. And what are you wiping it down with? Oh, just a damp, or uh, just a rag, maybe with a little bit of oil, okay. just a little bit, just just to dry everything off. But outside of that, gun goes in the case, and I'm going eating burritos. Yeah, burrito time. Dust cover, though, that is something I should pay more attention to. Yeah, if you're if you're gonna leave it around, you know, stored for a while. Yeah, yeah. Put a put a if you don't want to keep you know live rounds with it, put an empty mag in it, and then uh, close up the dust cover. Yeah. Back when I had an AR, Jim. I never close the dust cover. Don't yeah. you? Don't you have to have an AR to work here? Yeah, you should. It should be. I thought the that law. was in the yeah, company was, policy right. policy I manual. Even, like I just, mm. I feel you, like I'm so gonna, many people probably listen to this and they're like, well, "What's Mark's beef with ARs?" I want to throw out the fact that yeah, Mark, Mark doesn't have a beef with ARs. You just have a. You have a. Oh, is it a commitment issue or what? It's just a priority thing for me, um, and really, I don't know why, because I should. I think every American should own one. Honestly, I feel so what are you, semi-communist <laughs> by not having one. The weird thing is, like, I'm like the most pro-2A guy you could probably find. Like, There's things that we can't have that I just say, well, why can't I? Right. And yet, I somehow I don't have it. And, and you brought up the bolt carrier group. I think that's, that's one of the three things that I need to actually finish my AR. Those three things keep changing. I wonder if you have Here's what parts. they are. I'm going to go through it. The, the, to my knowledge, I don't have the, the pile of parts in front of me. I think I need a bolt carrier group. I've got an extra one. A gas tube. I've got an extra one. And a buffer tube. I've got an extra one of those. All right. Let's get it done. All right. This, this might be happening, folks. <laughs> All right. Good deal. So my last call is... Eventually, I probably do need to finish my AR. Uh, <laughs> We're on episode... Hold on. If you made bets, Vortex Nation, at the time of this recording, we've released episode 57. I don't even know what... Ep- hey, MC Ryan, you know what episode number this is going to be? Let's see. Six, 63. We're recording way out in advance, folks. That's why we're on 57 now and recording 63. We're this far in, Mark, and still... We're into, I feel like we need to let this happen naturally, though, because I don't want to. I don't want to. If if there are any bets out there, I don't want to. Uh, I guess impart any it's sort the, hey, of. It's the anxiety building in me. I feel, gonna dude. I've got a. I've and got that's, actually anxiety a, is natural. I've got a high level of guilt. I carry this with me. You should daily. Yeah, you happen, should. That you I know what though? One. If you can, if you just can't build an AR for whatever reason, if it's commitment issues or something like that. Then I'm gonna it's get not. you an AK-47. You know what it is? I forget about it, and I shouldn't. And I think everybody should have an AK-47 too. Okay, it's probably the ultimate. You know, well, you need a little variety in life. Buy yeah. American I mean, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should have both. All right. Anyway, you know, it's always the answer. We'll so when the, when my uh, oh, num- number oh hold on I'm not I'm gonna finish my last yep, call that call wasn't my last call this is number two number or seven. three last call. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel really good after this discussion because historically I'm just like a horrible firearm cleaner and maintainer. Like Why I just, do you feel good about that? Because these guys made me feel like it's not as critical as you might think. Okay. And also then... Well, cleaning isn't as critical as you might think. Yeah, yeah. I well, guess maintaining that's, is probably okay, more critical than you might think. Maintaining, yes. See, I transposed the things. And also pour some lube on it. That's my big takeaway. Yep. Yep. All right. That's it. Just kind of stole my takeaway. <laughs> um, AR-15 platform, extremely reliable as long as you use lube and check your magazines. These are the two things that will, will mess up an AR-15 or an M4 carbine super quick. As long as you are up on both of those, the rifle will run just fine. Noted. Yeah. Yeah, my last call is just uh, there's a difference between cleaning and maintenance, um, just like with your car. Just because you run it through the car wash a bunch of times doesn't mean it's going to keep running forever. Um, so you got to do more than clean it. 
That's it, a good analogy. It's, yeah. uh, I'm surprised I didn't think of that. Yeah. Just, Everything in life is like cars. Just that's right. You, just that's right. You get underneath the seats and get all those French fries doesn't mean <laughs> doesn't mean you don't have to change the oil in your car. Exactly. Yeah. And I guess that's that's sort of a good analogy. It, it's, yeah. it's preventative maintenance. It's a system of uh, you know having reliable parts, um, cleaning to some extent, parts inspection, pre- uh, replacing things hopefully before they fail, and uh, and keeping it lubed. So yeah, it's you got to do a little bit of uh, everything. So. Well, there you have it, folks. If you've been compelled by this episode, if you take anything away and you go look at your rifle, the first instinct should not be to clean it. It should be to start looking at extractors, bolts, and magazines, and all that stuff. So, hopefully we've created a uh, a more firearm maintenance community out there. Yeah. Yeah. Pete and Adrian, thanks guys for coming on. Our Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks to everybody out there who's listening. And uh, if you have any other questions about firearms maintenance or anything like that, definitely shoot them over to us either on Instagram or you know any of the million ways that you can contact us at Vortex. And uh, we can get you an answer to that. We can either ask Peter or Adrian here because they're uh, they're always pushing their rifles to the max down at the range, or uh, you know one of the other folks around here uh, talk to on the phone or on social media can help you out too. All right. With that said, let's sign it off with a good old bye. Bye Bye-bye. See you later. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.